a folder somewhere uh, with all of the presentations. Okay, start. Okay. <laughs> Uh, first poster, it's about comparing uh, computer models solving number series problems, which is uh, joint work with uh, Marco Ragni from Freiburg. And uh, in general, an artificially intelligent uh, system should be able to solve problems from standard intelligence tests as designed for humans, which is the idea of psychometric AI. So, Many, num many intelligence tests contain uh, number series problems as a part of them. And here you see one as an example that you see what we are talking about. And when you try to solve this, I already gave you a solution. Uh, typically you get five numbers. Um, obviously you need some uh, knowledge about natural numbers and arithmetic operations. And what are you doing when you solve this number series? You presuppose knowledge about natural number, uh, sorry, you identify differences between the first two numbers and then you generate hypotheses. Uh, and you try uh, to capture how the second number can be uh, generated using the first. And um, maybe you enumerate them. Typically you have a bias that you enumerate more simple hypotheses first and uh, then you might come up with a solution. Typically, you have some uh, working memory restrictions, especially as a human being, and so it might be harder to deal with larger numbers. Um, the Agi approach to number series problems, uh, when we look at this, it's plausible to assume that solving number series problems is based on a general rather than a specific cognitive ability. Uh, so this is also reflected in the idea of a chief vector of human intelligence and behind uh, the number series there is the idea that you need to identify regularities uh, for inductive generalization. Typically humans can explain the solution of formulating the identified rule. So we have knowledge level learning. So there are many systems around. You see that the earliest on were by Hofstetter in 86. Um, and uh, I highlighted here uh, two approaches, which are general AI approaches, artificial neural networks and inductive programming, such as Igor or Magic Haskell. And we were interested whether systems like these can solve these number series problems. So um, what we did uh, is um, we tried to compare these systems and uh, the problem we came up with is that uh, when you want to have a meaningful comparison, uh, you need to somehow define the complexity of the different problems to evaluate the strengths of the systems. When you look at psychometrics, uh, there you have the concept of um, item difficulty, which is not so helpful for evaluating um, AGI systems, in my opinion. And so other uh, possibilities were to have formal complexity. So there was a proposal from Klaus Dannegaard, who is sitting here. Or uh, you could use cognitive complexity, where there was some initial work in 83, in which we tried to pursue. So what we did in the first step, we got data from a study with humans solving a number series problems and compared the human performance with this artificial neural network approach and Igor too. And if you want to see the results, please look at the poster. And uh, hopefully we come up with a larger test suite next year, which we can present then to you. Thank you. Hello, I'd like to talk about uh, emotional concept development. And uh, this is a little B, I think. Uh, which is flying towards a flower and uh, perhaps forming a concept of that flower which it associates with something positive like good nectar. So uh, artificial emotions have been used in many different contexts, for example for selecting actions, selecting goals, guiding attention, as we heard Paul talk about, um, improving hope human robot communication, as uh, Ben talked about. And we want to investigate uh, another possibility here, to use artificial emotions uh, to guide concept development. 
So concept development can be divided into concept formation, which is memorizing, and concept elimination, which is forgetting. And uh, concept development is something that goes on all the time in the brains of vertebrates, and in particular <coughs> in our brains, plastic brains that are being modified constantly. And I think that concept, formation, concept development is uh, a very important topic for AGI. And um, in particular, I think it will be needed when we try to move away from the toy worms. So let's look at how Mother Nature has solved the problem of concepts development. So all animals, in, very many animals, have nervous systems. And their interface to the world is a set of sensors and motors. So if we take an animal like a bee that has more than a thousand sensors, can be in more in over two to the one thousand sensory states, and of course it's impossible to find to form uh, neural structures, co uh, concepts that represent all those states. Um, so somehow attention needs to re be restricted to concept formation of important states or important classes of states. But what would that mean? What does that mean? So for humans, uh, we tend to form memories of particular situations, not all situations at all, but of repeating situations and of pleasant situations and unpleasant situations. Those, si those situations we remember. So emotional factors play a role here. And also, they play a role in forget when we forget, because we tend to forget memories of situations that are not repeating, and also of situations that are emotionally neutral. So, uh, in our work that is presented on the poster, we have developed a graphical model, <coughs> transparent network model, for representing spatial and temporal concepts based on sensors and motors and also a prototype program for dynamic concept development that evolves concepts based on sensory experience and also on emotional factors. Thank you. Thank you. Are you done, sir? Yes, I'm done. Hi. Um, this is joint work with Maya and Tasmani and it's basically the result of two computer scientists trying to figure out what hap happiness actually is. <laughs> so, suppose um, I were to promise you that I'll give you a million dollars and for some reason you really believe me. And then instead, I give you a cookie. I guess you'll be quite unhappy about that cookie. Um, but then again, consider I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna smack you in the head uh, but instead, I'm going to give you a cookie. So here, you're actually quite happy about the cookie. And in both scenarios, the reward is the same, the cookie. But your happiness about the cookie is quite different. So here's our formal definition. Um, our agent, so it has the, the symbol for happiness is this little smiley face that's important. Um, so our agent has a value function estimate. And the value function is just reinforcement learning speak for you know, whatever I expect the future to bring. Um, and um, I have my history. Oops, can I use this? Right, so this is my history. I'm, I have C in history H, and I now see I take the new action AT, see new observation OT, get a new reward RT. And the, the happiness is then the difference of this reward and what I expected the reward to be. And this is just known as the typical difference error. And um, if you work in reinforcement learning, that crops up all over the place. All right, so what we showed with this definition is that um, it agrees with human happiness somewhat. So we got data from a, an experiment on actually humans um, that was run on smartphones. And our model agrees as, um, almost as well with the data than um, the, the model from the psychologists. Um, if you have, secondly, if you have an agent that knows the environment it's in perfectly, then in ex expectation, its happiness will be zero. Um, we can also prove that 
the happiness of off, on, off policy learners will be uh, less than the happiness of on policy learners in general, the wave terms. Um, there are some examples where, so in our definition, basically, you could think that just being really, really pessimistic about the world would give, make you very happy because you're constantly positively surprised by what you see. Um, but this is not true in general. So if you just, um, if you make your agent very pessimistic, it doesn't make it more happy. More pessimistic doesn't make the agent more happy in general. Also, if you just provide an increasing sequence of rewards, that also doesn't necessarily imply that uh, your agent is very happy. It all depends kind of of how uh, the agent estimates the value function. Right. So you should totally come to the poster and also vis visit patchwell.org, which is the website for the people of, for the ethical treatment of reinforcement learners. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm presenting something from the modeling or the architectures domain. Um, so it's about architectures and uh, oops, um, following two threads there, one being action selection. So how do we plan? How do we follow plans? And the other being world knowledge. So how can we um, get world knowledge into our architectures, which is still open in a way. So let's start with the action selection part. Often we have some dedicated system for goals. We also saw this in the open cock slides on Wednesday, for example. And um, there's some hierarchy and there's a, maybe a stack that allows um, recursive traversal of the whole thing and so on. And this has been criticized a lot, especially here by Altman and Trafton. Um, and their position is no goals are just memory traces like everything else. So you should not have a special systems of goals. You should just put it into declarative memory like everything else. And if you follow this, then this means that goals have activation. They have decay. They have priming. So they have the subject to sparing activation. Um, and in fact, this then helps explain, for example, why and when people make errors when they're <coughs> following plans that they already have. Now to the world knowledge part. Um, there's a nice um, system I heard about last year from Dario Savucci, who um, put an ontology that is based on Wikipedia into Act R. So the ontology is then named DVpedia, and um, the idea there is to use just the AR formalisms and use this ontology and then, for example, every page in Wikipedia is a concept and the importance of the concept is the number or is based on the number of links towards that Wikipedia page. So it's similar to PageRank in a way. Um, and what's cool about this is it's just using the <coughs> formalisms that were already there and just putting more stuff in from from Wikipedia, which is cool. Now, interesting is we say we have goals in declarative memory, we have large knowledge spaces in declarative memory, both are subject uh, um, and all of them have activation and so on. What happens when we put this together? Because the world knowledge now also forms a new activation source, a new priming source. And this is what the poster is about. So um, I got back to old data, reanalyzed this, and found some interesting stuff. Um, put the model in, learned a lot about both things, I think. So there are learnings for the uh, goal representation side. There are also learnings about which ontology you should use and why and so on. So come to my poster and I'll show you all of this. There is a number of AI system ba systems based on logic, but uh, actions or inference rules in those systems are pre pre specified or built, built in by pro programmers in other. So my question in, my, in this study is, 
Whether machines can uh, discover logic or not. <coughs> so first, uh, we uh, provide the uh, abstract framework for learning logic. It consists of agent, an agent and a machine. For an agent is either human or computer, but it has a deduction system. Okay? So in this case, uh, given a set of formulas as an input, it produces a theory. Then these in input formulas and theories, theories are uh, provided to this machine M. Okay. So this machine M has an algorithm for, for running. And it produces a set of actions or inference rules. Well, the question is whether this machine can reproduce the set of actions or inference rules in the original uh, agent. And in, in, in this model, the agent has plays the role of a teacher who provides uh, premises and conclusions, okay? And uh, the machine produces a set of actions for inference rules, but uh, those uh, inference rules or actions can be defined by incrementally uh, providing uh, data from the agent. And in, in, this, in this case, uh, we provide, we, we assume the agent which has a system of, of deduction, but uh, this is a very abstract framework for we can assume any system which has an uh, axiomatic system, <coughs> for instance, uh, nomotic logic or model logic or party logic or any logic. And alternatively, we can consider a framework uh, which has no agent. So in this case, given a uh, uh, input and output, output pairs, the problem is whether a machine can find uh, some regularities between those input and output outputs. So we have three questions. So the first question is, can we develop uh, a machine algorithm C uh, which can reproduce the original axiomatic system. Okay. And the second question is, is there any difference between learning actions or and learning inference rules? For instance, Gensel star logic and the Hilbert side logic. And the last question is more ambitious. So given this input, can, can this machine discover new logics? new axiomatic system K, which is semantically equivalent to this original axiomatic system. But in other words, in, th in this case, this machine plays a role of mathematician. Okay? Mathematicians try to find a new axiomatic system, for, for, for instance, positional logic or uh, predicate logic and so on. But in this case, whether this machine can play the role, role of mathematician. You have about one minute left. Okay. And uh, we provided a simple case study for learning uh, one step deduction using metallurgy problem. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Arthur Franz, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to make universal induction tractable through recursive program learning. And the motivation of this uh, all is the following. Um, Legge and Hutter have defined uh, intelligence as the ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. And uh, based on that, they, uh, everybody knows, uh, they have built um, IXIA, which is a combination of universal induction with a reinforcement learning built on top of it. Um, and, um, but, um, uh, universal indu induction is uh, not tractable at the, at the present and the big question is how to do it and uh, I've uh, made a, a very modest attempt uh, in doing so and um, yeah, let's see how, how far this goes. 
And uh, here's the ge general idea, kind of a general uh, approach. Uh, if you imagine the whole task space in, in such a plot uh, where up there is complexity and uh, uh, the bottom is uh, diversity, usually you can uh, view narrow AI algorithms as, as filling up a, a rather narrow stripe in such a task space. And uh, that's the whole difficulty uh, of it, um, because if you want to fill the whole space, you need more narrow algorithms and uh, somehow glue them together, which uh, turns out to be very difficult. Um, and the other observation um, that we can make is that humans um, rarely achieve the complexity level actually achieved by, by narrow algorithms, um, because we cannot search to the depth of whatever, 10 moves, moves ahead in chess. Uh, move, uh, humans are rather general, but uh, handle uh, arguably less complex tasks than can be done by, uh, by computers. And uh, um, I mean, to me, uh, the whole point of, uh, uh, of the orthogonal sort of approach of the AGI community is, uh, is uh, to actually um, start solving rather simple but general problems, but th and then pro proceed uh, towards the human sort of level um, and, and expand that, fill the, this cup sort of from, from the bottom up. And uh, let's see whether we can see that. Um, and in order to formalize, um, uh, and this is basically what, what I suggest, suggest to do and, uh, and, and try to do myself. And uh, first, uh, when uh, in, in terms of Turing machines and sequences that are going to get compressed, this is formalized in universal induction. Um, uh, we want to build such an algorithm that actually does the compression, right? In order to test uh, how well we have done, uh, um, as a benchmark, I executed all one, two, and three state Turing machines. Uh, there are about 10 to the 9 of them. And uh, computed 11 complexity of, uh, of each se sequence, and it's computable, right? And um, I have then uh, a pair sequence and their complexities. And um, as, as a test for... Um, for the uh, hopefully efficient uh, algorithm that I developed afterwards. And, uh, um, and this is it. I'm not going to go into it now, right now, but uh, uh, what you uh, see is uh, that in the, in the bottom there is a sequence, a binary sequence that comes into it. And there's a recursive, uh, s uh, several recursive steps, and at each step uh, the complexity um, goes down, the entropy of the sequences goes down to 30 bits which is uh, roughly uh, uh, the, the, the optimal size of this particular sequence. And uh, if you would like to see the details, how I did it, how this works, you're invited uh, to see my poster and uh, I'll explain it to you. Um, the result is that um, all sequences generated by one and uh, two state Turing machines could be compressed to the roughly opt optimal size. Um, and uh, as for the three state, state Turing machines, it's about 80% of the sequences, although it's pretty clear how to manage the other 20% too. So um, I found that rather cool because, uh, because it's, uh, it's a fairly um, large amount of sequences uh, from, from 1 billion Turing machines, it's 50,000 uh, different sequences that could be com compressed uh, using such an approach. Okay, and here's a little uh, outlook. If uh, you know, you may know from the 50s, uh, an example of uh, hydrogen simul, um, where there's, uh, oh, it's, see, you can see bad. There are tri triangles and then circle and uh, rectangle, and they move about and chase each other. It's, it's a, a fairly simple in terms of your code it. Uh, the complexity of that input is fairly simple, um, but uh, you can talk about it, you can, um, uh, you can describe the, the triangle, where is it, uh, what is its length, uh, you can you talk about all that, those objects, and since uh, universal induction uh, is uh, general, um, you should be able to do all that with such a system too. Like from, it, from concepts and, and so on about it. And that's basically the hope and, uh, yeah, um, one sentence said, is, <laughs> is, is this yet another blocks world? No, because the approach is uh, demonstrably general because you solve all problems below some uh, complexity level. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we have had a talk on uh, probabilistic 
for programming infer inference engine based on genetic programming methods uh, and uh, we also have uh, another work on uh, probabilistic uh, programming. Uh, this work uh, has uh, uh, two main goals. Uh, one is uh, to develop uh, more efficient uh, implementations than in the uh, scheme and uh, bind this implementation to OpenCV to so uh, solve uh, uh, image analysis tasks. And uh, uh, another goal is uh, to uh, study the problem of uh, model selection uh, with the use of minimum description length principle uh, in detail. Well, it can be skipped, I guess. Uh, as uh, Frank Wood uh, mentioned uh, is uh, his uh, tutorial, uh, we can get uh, uh, Bayesian a cam razor for free when uh, uh, we uh, use probabilistic uh, programming. So if we have some, for example, polynomial uh, generative model with the arbitrary number of uh, 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 of uh, components, of parameters, then uh, uh, we can uh, uh, easily infer posterior probabilities for the number of parameters and if uh, they are not fixed and uh, they are also sampled, then we can uh, easily uh, get uh, the best possible uh, prediction precision. So, uh, probabilistic programming uh, gives us uh, a Bayesian Occam razor for free, but uh, when we use optimization queries instead of uh, mm, uh, sampling uh, in accordance with uh, pastoral probabilities, then we will uh, easily get uh, some problems uh, because uh, uh, optimization uh, queries uh, uh, if we use them in a natural form, then uh, we specify some precision parameters. So we should compute uh, uh, complexity penalty uh, automatically. Uh, and uh, we implemented uh, uh, this uh, automatic uh, computation of uh, complexity of the model. Uh, for example, if we have uh, some uh, precision criterion, here is a very simple uh, model for image deblurance. So if you have some blurred image, uh, uh, we say let's find uh, such image uh, which is when uh, uh, blurred uh, with say Gaussian, uh, then uh, it will be most uh, uh, similar to this one. So this, uh, uh, can, uh, is, this is possible in our implemented language and uh, it can easily reconstruct uh, uh, some deblurred image, uh, uh, but uh, when we are talking uh, about models of different complexities, uh, uh, then uh, we need uh, to automatically calculate uh, uh, complexity to uh, also put some uh, penalty on uh, uh, precision criteria mm -hmm. since uh, users are usually define uh, final criteria for optimization uh, in terms of precision. And uh, this is uh, automatic uh, computation of complexity. Uh, it is included uh, in our inference uh, engine and uh, uh, we can uh, use it, for example, uh, in such uh, tests so when we have uh, uh, blood, uh, uh, mm, uh, my microscopic uh, images of uh, blood cells, for example, and we need uh, to count them. Uh, we can uh, construct very simple uh, generative models which uh, uh, draws arbitrary number of circles and uh, uh, we try to generate such a model which uh, uh, will be uh, more precisely coincide uh, to our image and uh, uh, we automatically introduce a complexity uh, uh, component in our criterion in addition to precision component and uh, we indeed uh, can get uh, the most appropriate number of uh, uh, circles, for example, in this case, uh, so uh, this approach works. <coughs> okay, I guess that's uh, all. Ah, okay. You have the next one as well, sir. Okay, so uh, you can read the conclusion, or I can read it for you. Optimization framework with the use of the minimum description length principle is devo uh, developed for probabilistic programming. High dimensional tests of image analysis are solved within it. 
Overfitting is avoided due to the correct uh, automatic application of the MDL criterion. Uh, well, but uh, even optimization queries being not uh, specialized cannot efficiently solve arbitrary induction tasks, uh, especially connected to AGI. And uh, we think that uh, the problem of such efficient inference can itself be considered as AI complete. Thus, deeper connections between AGI and probabilistic programming fields are to be established. And uh, here I'm going to the presentation of uh, my colleague, which, uh, can, uh, okay. which cannot have unfortunately uh, attend this conference. Let's make this one a little faster. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm not uh, entirely familiar with technical details, uh, uh, but uh, I hope I will be able to answer some questions at least. Uh, so, um, my colleague, uh, uh, he deals with uh, uh, such techniques as uh, metacomputations and uh, 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 supercompilation and so on, and uh, he says that uh, uh, these techniques uh, developed in computer science are not used in AGI because uh, uh, traditional uh, programming languages uh, don't support them. And uh, <coughs> this is quite unfortunate because these techniques uh, can be rather useful. Uh, well, as uh, Frank uh, would say, stop developing uh, new probabilistic programming languages and uh, 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 investigate inference uh, problem. And uh, uh, I definitely agree with him, but uh, since it is uh, much more easy to develop uh, own probabilistic uh, programming language uh, to uh, investigate inference uh, than <laughs> even my colleagues uh, and uh, we, uh, we develop different uh, languages. So, um, uh, he with uh, his uh, collaborators, uh, um, they decided to develop uh, uh, their own language, uh, which is uh, uh, something like uh, scheme with uh, pattern matching. And, uh, well, they uh, tried to incorporate uh, partial evaluation in uh, uh, their language. And, uh, well, as so far as I know, they uh, partially succeeded, so uh, they uh, used it uh, to solve uh, the general game plan problem. Uh, so uh, they wrote a very simple uh, uh, solver, uh, but uh, uh, this solver can be specialized uh, with respect to the given description uh, of uh, the specific game. Well. Uh, as far as I know, it is uh, uh, not the soul which is specialized, but uh, uh, they uh, gain uh, at least constant uh, uh, speed up uh, thanks to uh, they uh, somewhat compile uh, the uh, program which interp uh, interprets uh, this uh, a description of the game uh, and. Uh, uh, when it is running, it is uh, not necessary uh, to run this uh, interpreter uh, uh, each time. Uh, so you can uh, uh, get familiar with uh, the uh, YAPL, yet another probabilistic programming language, uh, uh, which uh, they are developing and uh, they implement uh, in this language all the necessary stuff, uh, including uh, uh, conditional inference, uh, special evaluations and uh, also optimization queries. Uh, so please, uh, if you are interested, uh, come to me. I'll try to uh, answer your question, but I'm not sure that uh, I know all technical details uh, again. Thank you. Realistic <laughs> model, I call it expression graphs. But what it's really about is me kind of uh, falling out of love with factor graphs. So, say, uh, five years ago or so, I was uh, very enthusiastic about factor graphs. I still think they're quite interesting. They're this very general representation which captures what's going on in a lot of different probabilistic models, including the Asian networks and Markov networks. And they also capture some non-probabilistic models. That, uh, they actually capture some things about the fast Fourier transform and other uh, important algorithms. But, um, it turns out they're not like 
as general as I had hoped in some ways. So um, some product networks are a very new uh, graphical model, which um, captures fast reasoning better than factor graphs for a restricted set of problems. Uh, I won't try to go through all the technical details, but I do suggest that people look at them if they're interested in probabilistic reasoning. They are an interesting format for kind of uh, capturing the network polynomial, which is the uh, polynomial representation of the function that you're performing probabilistic inference on. And um, so, uh, yeah, uh, factor graphs are, well, again, I guess I shouldn't go through the technical details in any level, but here's side by side what the properties of factor graphs and some product networks are. And so uh, it's kind of um, just reading the papers on factor graphs and on subproduct networks, the formalisms look quite different. And it's kind of difficult to think about um, like what the actual relationship between these two is. Even though some product networks were actually created uh, inspired by thinking about the cases where factor graph inference is fast. Um, but as I mentioned, they're actually fast in cases where factor graphs are not fast. So uh, the solution that I came up with is these expression graphs, which um, to my mind, they tell a story about what the relationship between factor graphs and some product networks actually is. And uh, from a practical point of view, what they give you is a formalism in which you can specify the very general kind of factor graph reasoning when you need it. And you can also specify these very fast models when you need those. So it's a formalism that now can capture uh, the important aspects of the reasoning in both models. And here are some pictures of these things. Uh, so here's, there's a factor graph and a sum product network side by side representing <coughs> the same function. Um, as you can see, the, the factor graph has these, uh, like both of them are on this x1 and x2 variables. Then the factor graph represents the decomposition of the situation into two functions. So this could represent a, a prior and then a uh, x2 given x1 function if it's representing a Bayesian network. Um, this isn't a very interesting case by any means, but um, then the sum product network has to represent the actual uh, computation of like building up this function from the pieces, which are called these indicator variables, x1 and the, the negation of x1, x2 and the negation of x2 with sums and products. Then here's an expression graph at the bottom. Now this ex particular expression graph, again, not a interesting complicated example by any means, but it is doing something that you cannot do in either expression graph, or in either sum product networks or factor graphs. Namely, it's giving you the uncertainty, which is a kind of structural uncertainty, between these two factor graphs shown right above it. So this expression graph would actually express the sum of those two models, which means it's a mixture model that uh, is expressing some uncertainty between whether you have this, uh, what I've illustrated is like a horizontal connection, which would be a horizontal probabilistic connection between these two variables, or a vertical connection instead, meaning that you're, uh, was it? Yeah, a couple seconds. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> So I'm Roman Polski, and I actually have two posters. I was scheduled to be 10 and 11, so I'm in two different clusters. To save time, I'm not going to come out twice. I'll just tell you once what I'm doing. Uh, the reason I can do it is because two posters are essentially on the same topic. The topic is recursive self-improvement. How can we create software capable of improving itself? And not just improving itself once, we already have that type of software, but improving itself more than once, meta improvements kind of getting better at improving itself. So there are two posters. Um, one kind of serves as introduction to that area. <coughs> I have a taxonomy of different types of self-improvement. Also included is a very comprehensive survey of different uh, papers published on that topic, pretty much everything I could find. Uh, the second poster gets into interesting <coughs> questions like, what are the limits to self-improvement? Are there software, hardware limits to that? 
what is the highest level of intelligence we can get to. It also looks at the, what is the minimum amount of resources you need to start this CDI process and so on. Uh, some interesting questions about convergence of uh, architectures, convergence of goals. Uh, there is a lot of other interesting stuff I'm not going to tell you about, because if I tell you, you won't go see my posters. So I'm going to stop now and uh, come see both of my posters. I thought that was going to be short, but Roman has <laughs> uh, been uh, much shorter than me. So, Ruby, you all have uh, had enough of me during these days. So, and this is about a thing that has been around for about 20 years, something that I... Uh, so, um, basically, uh, there are two approaches when you want to uh, aggregate uh, the, um, the results or the response or the rewards or whatever you... or the utility functions or whatever you want to call it uh, from a set of uh, problems, tasks, environments, whatever you want to call them, okay? So, well, uh, one idea is just to um, uh, use a notion of difficulty and then just for each difficulty just, and you, then you have a kind of curve for difficulty zero to difficulty infinite and then you calculate areas that you can just find a, a way where, or a point where this reaches some values. Another thing is just to ignore difficulty at all or just don't think about it at all and just aggregate using a, a, a prior or some kind of of weight or universe or, or sorry, or, or, or probability distribution. You know about uh, universal distribution used here gives these, um, the universal intelli intelligence measure. Uh, I don't think this is the right way to go because uh, this is in the end, uh, depending on the, on, the, on the choice of the reference machine, you can have that even you only give all the probability to just one single environment basically. So. And this was uh, uh, found by Hebert, and, and some, some people have talked about this in the past years in the ATI uh, uh, community. So what I, in this paper, I just try to uh, relate both things, just to see what's the relation about these two approaches. So one based on dif difficulty, and another one just ignoring the notion of difficulty. And in the end, it is not that difficult, it's just base uh, rule. So in the end, we have three possible ways. Well, the two first ways were uh, uh, basically what we had in the previous slide and in the general uh, sense. So the first one is just the, um, uh, using a, a, a universal distribution. In this case, you can use other distribution, but it's just the uh, use weights for your tasks. Another is just to do that first for your uh, difficulties. Maybe you could even use a uniform distribution if you can, you're able to prove that the, and that's some of the things that you can find in the paper or on the, or the poster that you find that the, the difficulty function goes to zero and you can calculate an area and things like that. And then you, you need to use a universal distribution in the end, but that has some other properties that I think are, are, are better than the original approach. And then there's a third situation where you can just uh, set the difficulty, then set the solution, and finally find an environment such that, that it's a solution. So that could be a possibility to generate, for instance, to generate tasks. And well, so that's basically a th three different approaches of averaging things or generating things or generating problems and aggregating them in, into a, a, a measure or a, whatever you want to call it, an intelligence measure, and that's what you can find on the poster. Concept of uh, Gödel agents. So we see Gödel agents in the lineage of the AXC model introduced by Marcus Hutter in 2000 uh, and the Gödel machines introduced by Jürgen Schmidhuber uh, first in 2003. And uh, well, the AXC model can be um, characterized by universally adaptable. Um, but it is not self-improving and incomputable. Gödel machine uh, introduces the concept or the idea of self-improving and uh, recursive self-improving um, and is computable, um, but uh, in a certain sense uh, as ontologically optimal or only in, in large uh, uh, spans of time because the 
proof searches and so on uh, hidden in the uh, Gödel machine uh, have the so-called, I call it the huge constant problem because you have uh, your optimal or uh, uh, your uh, efficient up to a constant factor or additive constant, but these constants are typically two to the hundred, two to the thousand, so uh, unfortunately these huge constants block immediate application of uh, these ideas. And uh, the Gödel agents now try to uh, scale down uh, uh, the idea of the Google machines to smaller contexts where we have uh, only a limited environment mem family and the Google agents, uh, uh, the agents themselves come from a limited family of, um, uh, of, of agents and so then they are adaptable with regard to the fixed environment family. Um, they are if to be Gödel agents, they have to be self-improving, computable, and they are initially optimal, yeah, because otherwise they get a bad score. So one can uh, visualize this uh, by uh, uh, depicting environments as uh, 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 living in a plane or in space, and the Gödel agents we define a loss distance, measuring how much loss because the Gödel agent uh, um, has to adapt to a given environment, then we get such a picture that the Gödel agent is an agent which is located in the center of this uh, family of environments. So I thought uh, I uh, said that uh, we talk about a scaled down version of Gödel machines. Uh, one of uh, his scaled down measures is that. Uh, we replace the full Turing machine by so-called Moore machines, which are in, uh, just finite automata, which uh, uh, just transduce signals. So they have a finite number of internal states, get inputs and transform it to output, and this is in an uh, uh, endless sequence of cycles. So the env and environment two is just a Moore environment not a full Turing machine. But of course, we can scale up uh, complexity by introducing a lot of states. So uh, and another effect is that uh, it's, it is synchronous. So it's, it's a real time uh, framework uh, where in every step, uh, the agent gets a percept and has to produce an action. Maybe uh, it deliberates longer, but the environment then maybe uh, can punish that. But uh, it's a level playing field. Uh, also, the agent can scan the environment in every cycle and uh, in some sense knows how long the environment is uh, needed to produce the next percept. Yeah, okay. So we have uh, a, dis a distinction between adaptability, which is finding better action for the same situation and self-improvement finding the same action but quicker. And yeah, well, finally, I want to use this uh, occasion to announce a small short sequence prediction challenge and ask you uh, if you see such a simple sequence of zero and ones, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, what would be your guess for the 12th bit? You can also produce probabilities or probability intervals uh, and uh, well, it looks like a fault problem but it has a deeper meaning and uh, it's uh, more explained on my website. And uh, yeah, if you think it's too short, then my question is what uh, would be long enough? Okay, all other questions, I love to answer it to the poster. Thank you. Marge McShane and I lead the Language Endowed Intelligent Agents Lab at uh, the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And as everybody here knows, the intelligent agents uh, unfortunately have to make too many decisions in too little time. So, and these decisions relate to um, perception, different kinds of and reasoning and action. And uh, well, uh, one of the directions of our work is to work on expanding 
uh, the inventory and uh, provenance of heuristics to help those decision functions. So in this poster, we present just a few of uh, our results, ideas, hypotheses related to uh, certain ways of making more human-like decisions during language understanding. And language understanding, we understand is, well, the way we understand it is knowledge-based, based ontology-based uh, extraction, representation, and use of representations of meaning, uh, which includes semantics and pragmatics and discourse and such. Uh, so uh, that is what we will present here, but this poster also will serve as a kind of um, annotated bibliography into the types of things that we have been doing over the past 35 years, and especially um, um, the um, uh, issues with integrating the provenances of heuristics in an application that we have been working on for the last 10 years or so, which is uh, an intelligent um, um, virtual patient system for training uh, medical students um, uh, to diagnose and treat chronic diseases. Uh, the interesting uh, uh, side of that uh, particular virtual patient is that we integrated uh, not only the capability of uh, indulging in a dialogue, but also some capabilities of learning, and uh, very interestingly, this to some of us, uh, a, a model of physiology and pathology, which is quite detailed and also uh, uh, allows us to have additional uh, sources of heuristics for various kinds of decision making. So anybody who is interested in these issues, Please come, let's talk, I'll be glad to discuss it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to present um, their, from <laughs> their thematic mapping to linguistic reasoning. So as the, you know, the reasoning is one of the key aspects of uh, achieving a AGI, so, and there, Language, natural language is, a main, uh, is one of the major sources of for reasoning. And uh, natural language has um, very sophisticated phenomena, and uh, as, as a case, uh, comparative is also a very sophisticated case. So now, just gonna show you how we, how our system represent, uh, uh, represent the, comparatives into the logic form, which is the open cock based atom space form. So first we have um, the syntactic parser and, the, and the some, some between syntactic and the log and the semantic system called relax. So uh, after, after the syntactic and semantic analysis, so we have some representation between uh, it's in some <laughs> dependency relation representation, like uh, for the first one, you can see it uh, means uh, the cute is the property of pumpkin. Pumpkin is the name of a dog. <laughs> then, then for we, we also uh, specify the comparative object, which use the comparative label. Uh, the third one of the list. So after after we got this relax representation, then we use uh, we use bunch of uh, rules and uh, which called relax to logic rule to convert into the logic form, the semantic forms. Uh, so we try to make the representation simple, so which is easier for 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 the for the. Uh, <laughs> Reasoning, reasoning process. So the main part of he, he, of this sentence is that we use the choose very greater than link to to connect the two main nodes, which also involve with some inheritance link. Then, um, for to understand the comparative sentences, which is very important for reasoning. Uh, for example, here, if we if we have the first two sentences, we can 
mm, we can we can achieve the. Oh sorry, <laughs> I, this is the, uh, the 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 three sentences are considered as the resource. Then we can achieve some uh, using uh, achieve that that the the, <laughs> the resort which is uh, like a. Bob, Bob likes Henry more than Manilo. Um, and uh, also, besides that, we can, we can get a lot of re related uh, information. For example, we could, uh, if we have those two uh, comparative semantic <laughs> representation, then we could uh, easily to get, get the similarity between the Hendrix and the Sinatra here. And also, currently our system is majorly like a rule based, which is not optimal. And now we are working on some unsupervised learning approaches. Thank you. And uh, the project is on cyber physical approach towards AGI. Uh, cyber, in a cyber physical system, the cyber should be clear, physical should be also clear. There's something which is physical, it's not only a computer. And uh, it involves complex systems in, such as factories with robots or intelligent transportation systems. And these are uh, safety critical, time critical, and they should be verified. And many uh, components of those are uh, deterministic. And the other hand, uh, anomalies should be avoided. Uh, let us see a few examples uh, that we are working on. Uh, such examples include uh, the human as such, simply because uh, within uh, cyber physical systems, there are also humans and anomalies might occur with them, just like this very recent tragedy at the Volkswagen robotic a company where a, a worker was killed by the robot. So this is kind of anomaly that you don't want to have ever. And uh, uh, the important thing is to learn about the manipulation, what the person is doing, to learn about the gaze, and through the gaze and the manipulation, to learn about the intentions of the human in order to parameterize the human and to predict and interact for the sake of the user. And we are using robots, the one, one is the Baxter robot, the other one is now that you see at the bottom. And also we use special tools, smart tools like eye tracking glasses, smart glasses, and many other options that, uh, uh, which are available. And one special application is uh, special need children or young individuals who are severely handicapped, that's a special case if they are in the traffic. And another one, an emergency situation, which is also a problem where the human needs help from the, from the environment. <coughs> but since the human is in the loop, from the point of view of AGI, this type of problem is very interesting because you cannot avoid to reach human level intelligence if you want to help the human. So if the human is in, problem, is, is in trouble, then the help should reach the, human, the level of the human intelligence. And uh, when should that happen? Uh, the concept of anomaly becomes very important here. It's something that you need to recognize, then to model, analyze, and control finally. From the point of view of, dete of the de detection, there are two types of anomalies and everything in between. One, that uh, the worst case execution time is not fulfilled. That one, which is a real problem. And the other one, that something occurs which you don't know anything about, which wasn't in your database. And this, this second one is also very important. From the point of view of analysis and control, uh, reinforcement learning could be of help and contains some kind of uh, exploration. And uh, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, functional programming is very well set for such an approximation of such a work uh, from the point of view of verification, but that's not the, the subject of the present paper. Going one step further, this is the third example. This is, a, again, a verification problem with very uh, large stochastic components. One was a problem uh, from the US Air Force Research Lab, 
that uh, we worked on, that's a real-time risk management, robot collaboration on explosive device removal. And the other one is, uh, that's a problem of today, that's the uh, intelligent transportation system where you have to avoid uh, collisions with other cars, uh, even if you have a driver or even if you don't have the driver, in both cases. And the verification should be subject to, the, to uh, stochastic problems, and these are real safety and time critical problems. And what is in the paper from there? In the paper, uh, I put forth, uh, we put forth factor reinforcement learning with a special optimistic initialization <coughs> method, uh, which we show, uh, has been shown before, we showed it before, that uh, it gives rise to polynomial time scaling, so optimization and verification can be fast. Hmm? One, that's, okay, that's good. <laughs> 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 and we also show that modules equipped with the robust controllers are properly set for factor reinforcement learning with the compromise that instead of optimal performance, you, give, you end up with epsilon optimal solutions, and that's this what you can find. And the control and epsilon optimality make the price for the low complexity verification in polynomial time. And the last slide is <laughs> about the <laughs> but thank you for mentioning is about our contributors from KTH Stockholm, Pat, uh, that's Deji Chen, Patrick van der Schmack from Technical Univ University of Munich, Daniel Zontag for the German Center for, for Artificial Intelligence, and Zonia Zirner from, from Siemens. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll try to keep it short. So we present a uh, computational model of grid cells which are cells in the anterior cortex, and here you see an example of their activity. And the interesting thing is that their activity is highly correlated with the position of the animal in the environment, and uh, they are also located in, in a higher end of, of the cortex, and so this is a rare opportunity to observe behavior of cells in these um, higher parts of the cortex. And uh, our motivation was to try to find a model that captures some general principle by which these kinds of cell process information. And what we came up with essentially is that we thought, okay, um, grid cells may perform an operation that is similar to uh, growing oil gas. Or, um, to a, or the, in other words, that grid cells um, may um, establish a prototype-based representation of their input space. And um, this is more or less summarized by the sentence. But also they interact with each other, so their patterns align and um, are distributed. And so this is not directly enough to use just a growing oil gas. So we developed a um, two-layer recursive growing oil gas as an algorithm which more or less models the behavior of grid cells very well. And uh, if you ask uh, how is this useful or interesting for AGI, um, the thing is that um, the input space representation that results from this kind of, of model is um, rather different than, for example, the input space representation that is derived by a, a group of perceptrons, for example. And uh, so this has, I think, rather broad implications. And if you're interested in knowing more about it, then just visit me at my poster. Thank you. So the last poster is about plan repair in reactive exchange using symbolic, symbolic planning. Sorry. So let us, I start by defining the context of my work. So uh, we find in the literature two complementary uh, approaches of planning, basically uh, symbolic planning and reactive planning. And symbolic planning is more classical planning that where the planner aims to construct a logical representation of the world that allows the planner to predict and anticipate the agent's actions. So the planning uh, process is divided in two steps, where the first step is in uh, uh, an offline planning phase, where the planner has to construct uh, sequences of actions that lead the agent from an initial state to a goal state. And to do that, to do that uh, yes, and the second step is basically execute the produced plan in the real world. And in order to do that, 
the planner has to uh, construct a complete and correct representation of the world. However, it be, is being proved that constructing a complete and correct representation of a dynamic world is uh, complex and can reveal, can reveal to be impossible in certain uh, problems. So the producer plan can fail during the execution and the planner has to construct another plan all over again. So to overcome this uh, limitation, uh, reactive planning was invented. In this kind of planning, we assume that the environment is too uncertain to be predicted, so we give up of uh, offline planning and we try to adapt to the changes of uh, observed during the execution. So we, uh, in this reactive planning, we aim only to predict the next actions of the next action of the agent. So we use a procedural modeling of the knowledge. We don't uh, need a logical modeling of knowledge, and it supports incomplete domain of knowledge. However, we lose the reasoning part of uh, symbolic planning, and we only execute tasks in the current state. And the most used architecture for that is React HTNs, hierarchical task networks, that, uh, that uh, consists of uh, representing knowledge in uh, and or uh, trees, uh, where, where tasks are uh, abstract, abstract tasks that are decomposed in uh, more primitive tasks that can be directly execu executed in the uh, environment. However, as the reactive planning aims on uh, works on incomplete knowledge, it can fail during the execution. Because reactive plan, uh, planning uh, adapts its next, next steps, uh, is, yes, next, uh, next action uh, on the observed changes in the world. And it can happen that uh, the planners uh, <coughs> uh, end up in the state where there is no more action <coughs> that can be executed in the current state. And the underlying causes of breakdowns are mostly that the agent, uh, other agents evolving in this uh, same environment shows change the environment, <coughs> or there is bugs in the HTNs where uh, actions are uh, not moved by net correctly or are not correct, uh, coded, not ordered correctly. So our proposition is quite simple. So we want to uh, take advantages of both existing approaches. So we built a hybrid system that starts with a reactive HTN, uh, execute in the current state, and when, he fa when it faces a breakdown, construct a, sim uh, a symbolic domain knowledge that is directly extracted from the procedural knowledge and call a, uh, a symbolic linear plan that can easily fix this breakdown and produce plan repair that is executed by the uh, reactive HTML. So for more information, please come see my poster. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's thank all the poster, poster speakers again.